I don't want to be the fun police, right? I don't want to be telling people quit caffeine, quit drinking. Because <laughs> nobody's going to watch Although, it. Although you've got the badge. <laughs> You're ready to go. Oh. I'm Michael. I'm Chris. And we're Breaking Impossible. So today I want to go over the first four of the 12 tools. Awesome. I'm all ears. The importance of keeping a regular sleep schedule. When you keep a regular sleep schedule over time, it has a huge impact on the quality of your sleep. Last night I was working on editing the video and uh, I, it kept me up. I was up till almost 11 o'clock. Well, I got half as much deep sleep as I ordinarily would do. Oh, interesting. And I've often compared the information I get on my aura ring with my dream headband, which is an actual EEG machine. But by, by and, the way, yeah. you should probably do a review of those things. Like you use the Garmin app. What did you call it? A dream band? Dream headband, yeah. And then and then this aura ring and the associated apps. And then you have something that attaches to your bed as well, right? I do. Yeah, so you should do a review of these things or at least an explanation, like what do they do and why are they different? Yeah, no, I will. But I compared it with the dream headband and it's still pretty significantly off. And it's discouraging to the point where I almost feel like none of this data is useful. But then I realized that no, it's there's two things. One, the aura um, information is getting closer and closer to the dream headband. So whatever it's doing using machine learning or whatever, that, that's actually what they say they're doing is using machine learning. It's actually improving. It's getting better all the time. So I'm optimistic that at some point it will more closely approximate what the dream headband does. The, the, the problem is most of the devices that we use to measure sleep don't measure sleep. They measure things that are related to sleep. And it's very hard to actually, it's just like having a heart rate monitor, right? You can wear something on your wrist or on your finger that measures your heart rate, but that's not gonna be as, as accurate as actually having a chest strap. Well, similarly with a, an ordinary consumer device, you're not gonna get the same results that you do from this commercial grade headband. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't make it for, um, they don't sell it retail any longer. So I got lucky I bought it when it was available as a retail product. And so it's, it's basically a neurofeedback collector. Right. Yeah, it actually measures brain waves. It's, it's not as accurate as an actual sleep study would be because in that case they would also put a chest strap on e to measure yeah, heart rate. And an e EKG and all the rest. Accurately. Just, yeah. yeah. But anyway, this is how I saw the you know half as much deep sleep, and I know for, I know it was mostly from having gone to bed late. Mm. Item number one is to keep a regular sleep schedule. How are you doing, by the way, on that? Uh, pretty good. Pretty okay. Yeah. Within yeah. a half hour to an hour. Yeah, oh yeah, easily. So I'm struggling with it. And the reason I'm struggling with it is because I'm also, I've been experimenting with uh, the time-restricted eating that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And for me, the quality of my sleep is significantly better the longer I have after I eat dinner before I go to bed. Mm -hmm. and the, re the reason that's a challenge is because I, <clears throat> I work until six or seven o'clock at night. And if I work late, I come home late, then I have a choice. I can skip dinner and increase my fast overnight, which I'm often inclined to do. It's easier for me to do that than to do it the other way around. Mm -hmm. Or if I do eat dinner late, then I have to go to bed later. That's not a good compromise. Mm -hmm. Or I have to go to sleep closer to the time that I ate. And I don't like that, that compromise either. Mm -hmm. And I've experimented with this, where to put my schedule and how to fit it in with my work life balance and it's been it's been very difficult for me yeah maybe you have more control over your schedule i don't, I don't know uh what i've done is i've just uh, i've set up two routines and a, and a deadline so for myself uh if i if i haven't started eating by seven so that i will finish by seven thirty, i just skip the meal that's how i decide 
Right. <clears throat> so that drives me to try to eat before then uh, or just live with it and, and just sink into it early in the evening, right? Uh, and so far, I haven't had to really compromise on that, although I have to admit I've gotten lucky so far. So yeah. we'll see how that goes. And then the other routine is the, uh, or two routines is I, I've taken up specifically some meditation mm -hmm. uh, about 90 minutes before bed just to, mm -hmm. to, to close out the day, uh, but then also give myself tools for throughout the day to, to remain a bit calmer and a little more perspective. I've only been doing it for a, for a week mm -hmm. and it has helped the seat quality, but not the quantity. Mm -hmm. So I, I typically do a, this routine that they, what do they call it? Uh, nervous system down regulation. <laughs> but basically it's, it's not like a bunch of big hard poses. It's a lot of breathing. It's a lot of gentle stretching. It's a lot of so sort of. It's breath work with some movement. <clears throat> yeah. And it, it uh, I've, I've found that that actually really helps a lot because, you know, just sitting weirdly with in, in office chairs all day, like mm -hmm. your back gets messed up and whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, it frees all of that up. And then then I sit and my mind just settles much way easier. And then I just sit and ha I do have some reading time or something else. And then mm -hmm. I go to bed. And I guess that's actually part of the routine too, is I've stopped taking the tablet into the bedroom at all. So I, I used to read a book from a tablet because mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't really much mental activity. I, I would choose books that you know were fun or light or whatever. I wasn't studying. It was just a novel. Right. But I finally figured out that, like, or I decided to try eliminating the light, eliminating any of that activity in the bedroom. So I do do the mm -hmm. reading. It's just that I end it a little earlier. So I head over to bed and just go to sleep. You know, so, that's interesting. We're talking about devices. There's, uh, speaking of devices, there are other devices, headbands that you can use that will help you purportedly to fall asleep or to sleep better after you use them. So they don't measure your sleep, but they allow you to do, to wind down. And the dream headband has a feature where you can listen to like ocean waves or different sounds as you're falling asleep. I don't use it though, because I'm using this other device that's generating a, another sound that's supposed to stimulate the deep sleep, which I'm very important to me. And I've, I've also learned the importance of, uh, so during, during deep sleep, your body produces human growth hormone. And when people get to be my age, they often get no deep sleep at all overnight. And I think it has less to do with their chronological age than it does has to do with how active they are and their, uh, their routines, whether they have these sorts of helpful routines that, that we're advocating for. There was a study recently where people were exposed to sunlight for 20 minutes a day, three times a week, and their testosterone levels rose significantly. Wait, you're not talking about like the toaster or whatever, right? You just mean normal sunlight. Normal sunlight, okay. exposure, okay. partly in their eyes, partly on their skin. Okay. Only 20 minutes a day, three times a week. Just doing that in a controlled double blind study, the people who didn't do it versus the people who did, people who did, their testosterone levels rose significantly. Hmm. That's just from 20 minutes a day, three times a week. So what we're talking about is, is doing 30 minutes to an hour of sunlight every day. That's what I try to do. Yep, me too. The second tool is to, to get seven or eight hours of sleep every night. There's a big difference between the amount of time that you're spending in bed and the amount of time that you're spending asleep. Have you paid attention to this? How much time are you actually awake versus how much time you're in bed? Uh, a little bit, but I kind of count on the watch. Okay. Well, right. that's what so, I mean. What is the watch telling you? It seems to be actual sleep. I'm not sure how long it actually takes me to go to sleep in there. Right. So the amount of time it takes to fall asleep is called latency. Mm. For most people, it's around 15 minutes. If it's more than half an hour, you should probably get up out of bed and go downstairs and read or do something different. But I like how you said, do go downstairs, like everyone's got an upstairs. In my case. So the, the difference between the amount of time that you're in bed and the amount of time that you're actually asleep is called your sleep efficiency. And it's usually expressed as a percentage and it's usually around 90%. So about 10% of the time that you're in bed, you may be awake mm -hmm. or 
in light sleep rather than deep sleep or REM mm -hmm. sleep. Mm -hmm. If you give yourself nine hours, you may only get eight hours of sleep. Right. If you give yourself eight hours, you may only get seven hours of sleep. What I've learned about myself is that I can get by on six hours sufficiently. Seven is adequate, but for me to thrive, it's got to be eight hours of actual sleep time. So that means I have to give myself what Matt Walker calls the sleep opportunity of eight hours, which is I have to be in bed longer than that. For me, it's about eight, eight and a half to nine hours. I have to be in bed to give myself the ability to sleep close to eight hours. Mm -hmm. I would say I, I only give myself an extra half an hour or so. So far, it's okay. But may, maybe I should rethink that. But although I don't think you've said it out loud enough of the sort of information and research you've been sharing, uh, which reminds me, you should also just create a, a thing that's like a, a list of all the links to all this research that you've been sending me through WhatsApp. Yeah. You know, this is not just, oh, I watched another YouTube somewhere else and gathered this up. It's it's actual medical studies with, with solid research and papers behind them. Yeah. So it would be super valuable to just collect all of those into one place. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, like <clears throat> you've said enough of this along the way, or, or I've read through those papers. That's why I started drawing those lines, right? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. my, my glide path, as I used to call it with 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 the wife, when the kids were, I was like, no, you can't just at 830, like throw them in bed and expect them to go to sleep. You've got to get them on a glide path so that when they hit the bed, then they'll be quiet and go to sleep. I'm just doing that that same approach with myself now. And, it, yeah. and I'm just trying to regularize, routinize, something like that. Yes, that there's, there's interesting things that happen as you're getting close to to being ready for sleep and one of the things is that your body temperature will drop about one degree hmm. it has to do that in order for you to be able to fall asleep and then it usually drops to uh e even even further overnight to a couple of hours before you wake up in the morning there's this thing it's your 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 minimum temperature overnight hmm. also your heart rate tends to drop and about in the middle of the night Hmm. You're, it drops to its lowest point on average and things like eating late or drinking alcohol or going to sleep late can have an effect on when your resting your lowest heart rate occurs throughout the night so yeah. then what's the next tool the third tool it has to do with caffeine and you've asked me this before but caffeine has a half-life of six hours and that means that at 12 hours there's a quarter of the caffeine going through your bloodstream so essentially, if you have coffee in the morning at nine o'clock and you go to bed at nine o'clock, you still have a quarter of that caffeine in your bloodstream. And depending on how much caffeine you've consumed, it can actually reduce your deep sleep by as much as 50%. Hmm. And there are people who have a genetic difference that allows them to be able to fall asleep even when they've consumed caffeine throughout the day. Hmm. I, have that, I have that gene. I can drink coffee and still fall asleep. I'm envious. It's not, it's not falling asleep that's important here. It's the quality of the sleep. And it's the right. deep sleep in particular that gets damaged by caffeine. So I try to have 12 to 14 hours. A good rule of thumb is to stop drinking coffee at, by noon at the latest. For me, usually nine or 10 is the latest. And I try to finish my coffee around 6.30 or 7 o'clock whenever I can. So my coffee habits, interestingly, uh, I tried... It's called red bush tea. It's from South Africa originally. I guess it's cultivated all over now. Because I decided I wanted to just cut down on caffeine and just try that for a while. And mm -hmm. I think I think you know from our previous discussions, I, I would drink a pot of coffee in the morning easily, and then a, another two, three espressos during the day because we have a barista at work at certain hours, and it was just easy. Sure. But I decided, you know, due to these these kinds of informations and everything, that I should really try to you know, cut down on that. So I was drinking black tea for a while and that, that's got much, much less caffeine than coffee. And then I came across this, this red bush tea, this rooibos or whatever it's called. It's very much like a uh, smoked tea. If you've ever had, I think what they call lapsang su chow in English. It's like that, but lighter, not so very smoky, but with that kind of flavor. And so you can brew it really strongly and it has that strong smoky tea-like flavor. It goes mm -hmm. great with milk or you can brew it lightly and then it, it's got like a fruity flavor, but in any case, it has no caffeine. Uh, and so 
I can drink it all day long. I can drink it right up to bedtime or whatever I want. It's all good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been doing that for 10 days now, and it, it seems to have really made a big difference. I, I have this week had one espresso during the day at lunchtime, so I'm sure my my 12-hour half-life is not optimal. Uh, but so far, I haven't really noticed that it's affected my sleep noticeably. Like, it's been other things. Yeah, it, indeed. So I've also equally been monitoring the uh, the HRV using the Elite HRV app, which monitors using the chest band, doing, mm -hmm. doing an EC, ECG rather than a light-based, wrist-based thing from the watch. Mm -hmm. For reasons I was describing earlier about, like, how I just don't trust the Garmin systems right now for any of those sorts of things for lots of reasons, especially around user experience. Yes, Garmin, I'm talking to you. As a result, I'm paying attention. They ask you like, how sore are you? Mm -hmm. And I've related that actually it's the soreness that drives my sleep much more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's uh, as many may recall, it's not muscle soreness all the time. Although many times it's often just this heel calf problem so if i've mm -hmm. uh, gotten over the typical just running soreness mm -hmm. that may have a sharp pain that can still wake me up at night and that that is more important than can caffeine more important than the glide path more important than anything else mm -hmm. so i'm trying to figure out how to deal with that again well that brings me to the fourth tool which is to reduce or limit the amount of alcohol that we're consuming I'm doing great on that compared, not as good as you, but way better than I was doing. I'm still dry. I haven't had anything to drink in over a year. Yeah, I've, I've gone, I've halved it again. So I think so it's every other week. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Um, and, and we're, we're trying to find some other things. So that got easy because I realized there's a traditional, uh, holiday drink here called Glug which is typically a hot mulled spiced wine. And then they have, as, as is really a treat here, many different kinds of alcohol, non-alcoholic versions of all of the alcoholic things. It's like, it's an adult drink, meaning it has lots of layers of flavor and interest and, you know, you can mix it with things. So like this, this particular, so there was one that was apple and this one is more, uh, I think they even called it like mojito. So it's got like citrus and mint and, so you mix it with some other things and like you've, you've got a drink that's enjoyable, although you're not alcoholing it at all. So alcohol affects REM sleep. Mm. Caffeine affects deep sleep. And this is why it's important to be very careful about how much and when you consume either. So uh, that's actually also, I've taken your advice on that one. Uh, so I, I, you know, I used to enjoy when I do enjoy it, it used to be around eight, right? Which is quite close to bedtime. You know, I usually mm -hmm. go in around 10 and try to be asleep by 1030, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's quite close from that, that sort of digestion thing. And I think it was, um, and I'm sure we're repeating this from some of our other discussions, but you prompted me to read about how the sugar gets digested and it's not necessarily the alcohol per se, but many hours later, when your liver has actually converted that into sugars, it dumps all that sugar into your bloodstream, waking you up. And I was like, oh. And then, of course, it's a diuretic. Yeah, and just all the really messes up your sleep. Yeah. And so, like and it... all these things, I was like, oh, so now if I do have something, it's always, I have another one of those lines. It's always like by five. If I have yeah. anything after five, yeah, uh, it's like you say. I have to trade off and go to bed earlier. I have to do something else, and that, then I realize the cost of that, either yeah. in deep sleep or REM sleep and whatever. Well, it's 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 like the caffeine thing. There are some people that can take caffeine late in the day and still fall asleep, but they're not aware of the fact that it's affecting their quality of sleep. Right. Similarly, people get confused about alcohol because it's a sedative, and it makes you sleepy, and so they confuse that with being able to fall asleep, and get better sleep but it's in fact not the case at all you you may be able to fall asleep easier but the quality of your sleep is significantly impacted yeah there's a big difference between sleep and an, an anesthetization yeah the right word i'm not sedation. drunk right now but sedation is not sleep i'll quote matt walker again yeah there you go I yeah like I, you, I like how you sidestep the word there i just want to note that when i <laughs> 
when I was in Canada last year in October, before I went to Hong Kong, I was still drinking. I was going to write a post about day drinking. I thought it was okay to drink as much as I wanted, as, lo as long as I gave myself plenty of time after I finished drinking before I went to bed. So it'll be fine. There were a couple of things going on there. I was just getting blasted early in the day. <laughs> And I was eating poorly. And it's no surprise that I gained 10 pounds while I was in Canada, even though I was running. Yeah, I was just going to say, I know how many miles you were running. Like, that's nutty. You no, I was running a lot. And I, so what I was doing is I was drinking with, with my lunch. And so I would have a couple of beers and then I would have a cocktail and then I'd have dessert and then I have another cocktail. And, uh, yeah. yeah so this, this is just the highlight between our drinking to start with. Like I, I, that's like a month's worth of drinking and more for me, period, yeah, like well, ever. It's a slippery slope. So yeah, that's part of the reason why I haven't gone back, even in moderation. I've decided that I know enough of the things that it can do, that it prevents me from even having one. Yeah, yeah. And I'm perfectly fine without it. Yeah. And I've, as I've said before, there are lots of good reasons to quit drinking. I'm still learning a lot. Yeah, I know you are. Which um, I want to encourage you, like as much as I value all of this, and I think it's awesome, and and I know that it gives our you know the twelve tools and, and our our approach and everything else, um, real legs to stand on. You got to get on the road more, man. Like I put in thirty k this week, and tomorrow I'm going to go thirty k in a day. Uh, oh, you're talking about time on feet. Yeah. What did I say? Yeah. So later when we've done all 12 of the 12 tools i'm going to tell people that the the hard work of getting out there and and moving is the most important one of the 12. yeah well before you tell people that you gotta go do it like for your own good yeah no i've been careful of my ankle oh is that still bothering you yeah i need to go oh, see a doctor geez. you do i need to go see a foot and ankle specialist you, do. Uh, you know interest interestingly we're, we're talking about how it affects sleep the fact that I haven't been out there as much has had a, a, a bad effect on my sleep, more than I would have expected. I, I'm noticing the same thing. Yeah, and later, later I'm going to talk about it. We haven't gotten to the uh, to the three tens of sunlight and all that, but the two most important things you can do to improve your sleep are the amount of sunlight that you get throughout the day and the amount of exercise that you get. Yeah. And, you know, I've talked to you about not wanting to take any kind of um, testosterone replacement therapy or take any supplements or anything like that. But behavioral things that I can do, I'm focused on. And yeah. those two simple things, just getting more sunlight and getting more exercise, have a greater effect on the quality of your sleep than anything else you can do. So don't forget to go outside, do hard things, and keep moving forward. We'll see you out there.